it's been an ongoing joke with Lock and Stash and I that we would Heidi fart in one of the uh, these videos that they've let me work on. Uh, and with the Jimmy video, there were a ton of opportunities to uh, <laughs> hide one. Uh, so inside of the Jimmy video, there is a fart hidden. What does a sound designer do? A lot of the time, for me, for instance, uh, I am generally tasked with creating an, a sonic environment. Uh, so capturing all the sounds that would make that environment come to life uh, to match the visuals. For production, I was tasked with uh, location sound, uh, with capturing the live action sounds of Jimmy on the trails. In for post-production, I uh, created the custom sound design, original Foley, it was sound editing, and as well as a mix. So for the Jimmy shoot, I was able to capture a ton of Nat sound. Percentage-wise, I would say 70% of what you hear in the Jimmy video is natural sound. Thirty percent of the the other sounds that you're hearing are Foley and uh, just crazy sound effects that I've blended together as a hybrid beautiful mix. Everything you see above here, this is all natural. This is all the camera natural audio. This is all the lav natural audio. This is the Foley section here, the yellow. Purple is more camera audio. Red is the sound design, the abstract, the hits, the impacts. With pre-production, what was really nice was Lock and Stash had taken a moment to scout uh, and decide that they wanted to shoot this in the fall so we can capture all of the greediness. And this specific example was so nice because Jimmy had already in mind what he wanted to hear. Uh, his bike is a very specific bike, uh, so he knows that it'll sound really, really different on this trail comparatively to other trails at a certain time of the year because there's leaves out, there's gravel, so he had already in mind what he wanted it to sound like. Uh, so it made it really simple for me on pre-production. Good luck. I think the most difficult part of the Jimmy video definitely was carrying around my equipment, making sure that I'm not capturing any of my noise or the crew's noise of walking through the leaves and the gravel, but just focusing as much as I can of c capturing all of Jimmy and his, and his sounds. For the post process of the Jimmy video, it's generally the same that I do for my scoring as well, and that is I watch the video a few times, learn all the cues and segments. So for instance, if he's bumping on a, on a few rocks, how is that gonna sound? Making sure that the natural audio's matching with what I'm gonna add with Foley and sound design as well. How does that transition sound to the next? Because I really believe that transition is so key uh, in videos like this, uh, because there's a lot happening, a lot happening fast. Uh, and so for post-production, it really was just learning the timing of it, what are those sounds gonna sound like in each segment? Uh, and then it is going back in for the mix with the EQs and the pans, making sure that it really has a big and wide soundscape since it is so crunchy and raw. I haven't been sending it lately. So with hiking trails and getting into the locations that we needed to be, we had to keep our cameras super stripped down and only the essentials made it on the trip. Um, so this was a camera. This was mostly getting our super tight, long telephoto shots. That's why we have a Canon 70 to 200 on it um, with a Revolva, which is a new internal thread Canon mount ND system. You can see the ND filters are internal inside the lens mount and each of them goes up in a stop variable. So this cartridge goes from clear to 0.9, and then there's another cartridge that goes from 1.2 to 2.1, and they just kind of spin around. The EF mount's a captive type mount, and so in order to put your lens on, you line the red dot up where it usually ends up on an EF, and you place and hold and then you start to spin, and that's what locks in the lens. 
and then it's a nice solid connection. Going down the line, we have the red side handle, which is great for rolling iris, um, doing some kind of focus stuff, and just having like a really solid grip that can control all camera settings. Um, and then the light carbon fiber seven inch monitor that Red makes and just simple, small 98 watt hour batteries from IDX. And we use the wooden camera top handle that has a record start stop built in. And the nice thing about all this is it all breaks down with toolless screws so we can pack it into a bag in case of like a rainstorm or any other emergency. We can pop all this stuff off and then it just drops right into our uh, bags and we can get out if we need to. This last piece here is a wooden camera LCD riser, which allows the monitor to clear the revolver because you can see the revolver sticks up quite a bit from the initial surface of the camera. Um, and these are great for the five inch monitors that are, aren't toolless and it turns this into a, a toolless thing. But in this situation, it's just a really lightweight option to get the seven inch higher than the revolver so we can still use that on top of the camera. So this is our super lightweight travel tripod. It's a lightweight Benro head that supports up to like 15 pounds. It has nice drag, good counterbalance, so you can kind of set your camera and leave it wherever, and it'll basically stay at this kind of payload. There's three stages of drag. So this is absolutely none. And that's just counterbalance bouncing back. And you can turn the counterbalance all the way off so there's no drag at all. And then we move down to the carbon fiber legs, which are some aceable three stage that allow us just to be super light, really efficient, and they fit to, on the side of our bags. Um, and we can get super low to the ground with them because of this tie down being flat underneath. So when you're in the woods and you have obstacles and rocks sticking up, you can get as low as possible without having that interference from a longer tripod tie down. So a camera was most of our long telephoto shooting down trails down the line. Um, and then we used our second camera, which is B cam on our Movi Pro. And this is also set up in a really lightweight configuration. Most of the time we were running it blind, which relies on a secondary gimbal op, which controls everything from the Movi controller. And that allowed us just to be super light really simple and we just needed to move the gimbal through space as I controlled where the camera was pointing. And so with B camera, we were mostly getting wide movement, swooping shots and some tracking shots when we could keep up with Jimmy. Um, just kind of going down the line, we have another Canon lens on here. It's the 24 to 105 because it gives us a good range. It's pretty compact. We have another Revolva on this, which also helps be super lightweight and not having the weight of a ND filter on the front of the lens is really helpful for gimbal work. Um, you will strain it a little bit whenever we zoom, but it's not enough to affect the performance of the Movi. This setup's a little more complicated because we have to have a Teradek that sends to the Movi controller. Um, that allows me to focus and control all camera settings and the gimbal itself. We have the Ignite Digi offset brackets on the side that allow the camera package to be further back, which helps for balance and getting motors in the, into small lenses and everything. And then we have TB50 battery adapters, which allow us to have like a two hour runtime, which is totally essential when you're hiking into the woods all day. You don't have to switch batteries every 40 minutes and they're just way more reliable. And we kind of keep this red monitor up here just for emergencies if we need to control camera settings or if that operator needs to see an image really quick if we're off doing something else with the second controller. We have the red jetpack on the back here that allows all the cables just to go straight down, which is a must have for gimbal work because we can throw a super heavy cinema zoom lens on here and all the cables are not interfering with the roll bar back there. And going into the Mobi controller, we have it set up with a small HD 702, which is ultra bright and it's really sharp at 1080. Um, and we're using a Teradek 500 system because most of the time we're not running super far from each other. So the 500 gets plenty of good range um, and everything is running off of one central V lock on the bottom of the Mobi controller uh, that's powered by this uh, single switch right here. So we can turn the whole system off and the whole system back on. And the Mobi controller does everything from gimbal pointing, exposure, camera settings. Uh, we can do zoom and then focus with this knob. 
And the nice thing is FreeFly communicates with RED and RED communicates with the EF lens. And so we can control the internal aperture with the iris knob without having an extra motor on our system to keep it really lightweight. The motors we're using are the Red Rock Micro SLSs because they plug directly into the Movies tilt stage unit and they're completely compatible with the entire ecosystem that FreeFly has built. So it's great that we can run single op, multi-op, and then someone could even have a third hand unit somewhere else controlling focus if we need. So I rigged our transmitter to be as out of the way as possible. And when you do that, your antennas kind of get blocked, especially with doing a lot of handheld stuff with people because you're going around corners or turning and the antennas just get blocked by the camera. So I ran some internal antenna extension wires that I just got on Amazon. So they're basically going through this tube here and then out the back. And then we have one antenna on this side. And this is the lock and stash stash antenna special here hidden right inside of the tilt tube. You just pull that out and it's connected to the Terra deck internally through these little extenders. And then when you're done, it stashes back in. For this shoot and other shoots like this where we're traveling and hiking, um, we choose F-stop bags just because we've had the most luck with them and they're the made by professionals for a professional bag that we found. For this shoot, the A camera didn't really require much at all. And so we use this bag that they've since discontinued. It's called the Harney, I think. Um, and this just allows us to carry super essential things. It holds three or four V-lock batteries. And then we have our extra lens, um, just in case we needed a wider shot from sticks. Um, this is just like a little shoulder harness. I mean, you can strap it onto a bigger bag. Everything's made really durably. Um, this thing's multiple years old and it still functions the way it was when it was new. Um, and then we always have a, a Gerber center drive on us. It's just a really nice tool to have quick access for everything. Something always needs fixing, especially in shoots like this. For our main bag, we use the Talopa for just about everything. It's the maximum size allowed for carry-on for airplanes. And in this situation, it allows us to carry all the gear we need and more. Um, there's straps around the outside everywhere for strapping stuff on like tripods. This is my little movie controller tripod. Everything is in a waxed waterproofing. And so in light rain, it'll be totally waterproof. Heavier rain, we could throw a rain fly on it. Getting into the interior of the bag, there's a top pouch that we can use for stuff like snacks, keys, radios. The main compartment's accessible through this zipper, which allows me to put my Movie controller up here, an extra rain jacket, any other clothing items or anything else you need. In the main compartment, you set your bag down on the ground and so it doesn't get your back dirty whenever you put it back on. And this allows you to access the main compartment, which has everything that we need in it. So we usually put batteries low just to keep the weight lower to the ground. Um, and basically you can reconfigure this into whatever you need. We have stuff like Moby handles, headlamps, little baby Moby, um, more batteries, which are a must. And then my little Moby Go toolkit, just in case you need to fix anything on the go. Some extra cards. And the nice thing about the way that you can reconfigure this, you can buy different ICUs, which are the internal camera unit. You can pop this thing out and it's totally separate from the bag, which is great for airline travel. If they make you check your bag, you can at least pop this out with all the important stuff. And this is also just nice to toss in a Pelican if you need, um, or just have on a camera cart, just as a, another bag that holds batteries or lenses or whatever. Another nice feature is everything's fully adjustable and it's made to be a hiking pack. So there's an internal frame that's really supportive. It's got a hip harness and a chest harness that really allows it to not be bouncing around and you can put it where you want it and it'll stay there. And another feature is on the go, even for photographers or anyone else, you can keep your hip strapped and spin this around and then you can access your camera compartment from right here and grab something quick, zip it back up and then you're good to go. 
Another nice feature about this bag is there's all sorts of straps for skis. You can put snow shovels in this compartment in the front. It's also good for toilet paper since we're in the woods. Um, and this little compartment here is good for storing little stuff or you can stick a leg of a tripod in there and then strap it up here so it's not dangling and hitting your legs as you're trying to walk. It's up nice and high. On each side, there's a side pocket that's expandable with these Velcro straps. And so you can throw big stuff in like water bottles um, and everything's still pretty water resistant. Thanks for watching. If any of this was helpful, please like and subscribe. And if you can find the fart noise, please let us know the time code and where it's at and we'll send the first person a free t-shirt. Thanks. <laughs>